<laughs> All right, so I'm uh, introducing Rick Farina. He's not the guy that introduced me to Goatsy, but he did introduce me to Lemon Party. We got, we got two minutes, I guess. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I guess there's enough room back here. <laughs> for me to hide? No, for our two minutes. <laughs> so he's going to be doing a talk uh, called Free Floating uh, Hostility, and uh, without ado, I'd like to set you up to uh, Zero Chaos. Whee, where's the applause? Come on, there we go. <laughs> Let's see if we can make these things work. Can you hear me at all? No? Awesome. So I'm Zero Chaos. I hate all of you as much as you hate me. <laughs> Piero, dude, like, if you're going to start off, at least get a, score a hit. Score a hit. And it even fell off the end of the stage. Now I got no ammo. I'll throw in the water bottle and I'll finish it. Are we actually at time now? Close enough. I don't even care. We'll get this back on track, right? I'll, I'll try to run long before I keep you all here. I'm so surprised that people showed up. I wrote this talk because they asked me to speak, and I hate so many things that, well, I just decided to talk about things that I hate. So who am I? Uh, I'm a jerk. Nobody likes me. Uh, I'm an IRC op. That's probably why nobody likes me. Uh, do Wi-Fi security, amateur radio. I'm an asshole. Uh, and I'm generally disappointed in the security industry, and that's you guys. Uh, we all take uh, a lot of noise and jump up and down, and nothing ever changes. So hang your heads, seriously. Okay? I'm just really just bitter, just bitter in general at, at all, the, all the things that are going on. Okay? Okay? We're going to go over a couple of things that I hate, uh, lots, lots and lots of hate, hated words, hated ideas, and uh, a couple of major personal hatreds with real world examples of why you all suck. Uh, everybody has a self-identity, right? An image of who you are in relation to other people. And for some reason, whatever choices you make are elevated onto this magical pedestal Whereas the choices that I make are, are like thrown down and nobody really cares. So I, I want to just start this off with offering a compromise to everybody. Okay? I'm going to talk about a lot of things and you might have an opinion and that's great. And I'll respect that your opinion is wrong and you listen to me because I'm on the stage. Okay? Great. Thank you. Okay? Starting right off with hated terminology. Cyber war, cyber warfare, cyber terrorists, cyber bully, cyber theft, cyber sex. What the hell? All right? These are really, really stupid words, every last one of them, okay? Why? Let's take cyber bully, okay? Picks on, uh, a regular bully picks on somebody, right? They call them names, they exclude them from a group, they push you into the mud, maybe they, uh, they slap you in the face with a trout, okay? A cyber bully, cyber bully's gonna call them names on Facebook, woo, okay? They, they won't let you join their Facebook group. Man, I really wanna sit at the Facebook lunch table with the cool kids. They throw a virtual mud ball at you, or a snowball, or whatever gay thing's going on Twitter today. Or they slap you in the face with a trout. <laughs> well, if you were old enough to remember MIRC, you'd get the trout reference, but that's okay, because then I know. Uh, a cyber thief. Okay? A thief is someone who breaks into your house to steal your cash, your TV, your MP3 player. Maybe you've got some valuables, maybe you really don't. Kind of like a cyber thief who breaks into your bank account, steals all your money. Maybe you have money, maybe you don't. But the point is, the guy stole, or he didn't steal. What the hell difference does it make how he did it? If they rob you with a knife on the street, or if they ask you for your PIN number for your bank card, they're stealing from you. Cyber thief versus a thief is just an added word that means nothing, right? It's like pre-boarding the plane. How do I get on the plane before I get on the plane, right? You can't do this. You're getting on the plane or you're not. Then I mentioned this talk is like half stolen from George Carlin, okay? So what does all this mean, okay? I'm a hacker, this is what I do, right? So I'm gonna hack into OnStar. And I get the GPS location of the nicest vehicle I can find. I'm gonna go over to it. I'm gonna remotely unlock all the doors, remotely start the engine. I'm gonna drive the car away. What's that make me? A cyber car thief? <laughs> right? So I, I tried to get a picture of me in GM's nicest car and I couldn't find one at all. <laughs> We all paid for that joke, too. <laughs> all right. What is the picture of a cloud? What's funny? I hate the cloud. 
And uh, I'm really sorry that Decode's not here to be on stage to do this for me. So for all of you that understand, it's in the cloud. Thank you. Thank you. That's my best Decode impression. I'm tiny and pathetic. Uh, so what does this really mean, right? The cloud was originally called software as a service, right? They sold you software without actually selling you any hardware. That made sense. Software as a service. That describes something as cloud. The only thing that comes to mind is a cloud. This is a completely meaningless term that we've attached a completely new meaning to. Why? Because marketing people realize that when you say cloud, there's like some warm, fuzzy feeling attached to it. I get a warm, fuzzy feeling looking at clouds. Okay. What is this really? It's outsourcing your hardware to somebody else. Virtualization on a potentially massive scale. You know, you hire Amazon and Microsoft. Really bothers me that Mac runs their cloud platform on Microsoft, but that's another part of the talk. Uh, right? So it's, it's kind of a loss of control. So we invented this idea of a private cloud. Private cloud. <laughs> you know, this, this picture is just like thousand, thousand different ideas rolled in my head. A private cloud. What the hell is a private cloud? How many of you own a cloud? We all do. We all do, exactly. Right? What the hell? You're virtualizing stuff in a rack, and you feel the need to, if there's not a picture of a bloody cloud on there, this is just the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life, okay? Stupid, I hate marketing, let's move on with life. Open platform, I really wanted to put in here, and I started ranting on it in here, and then I realized that I needed to move this somewhere else into my hated ideas section. Uh, this has been harped on so badly at this con, I'm gonna try really hard not to stick here too long. What the hell is an advanced persistent threat? Apple it's an Apple It's an excuse. Thank you. It is an excuse. Okay? Advanced persistent threat is a completely meaningless term that we made up because it sounds really scary. It sounds really scary, and what it really means is your antivirus doesn't pick it up. All right? And that's not a knock on the antivirus guys. That's a knock on all of you for being pathetic. Okay? How did we fail in life? Okay? There's worms, there's viruses, Trojans, buffer overflows. All this stuff that is attacking us constantly, assuming we have a job. <laughs> okay, all this stuff is attacking us constantly, and we're just not doing enough about it. So what's an APT? It's something that your current security doesn't, uh, doesn't block. Is Meterpreter an APT? Is Sigwin DLL an APT? No, it can't because my antivirus picks that one up. What about WinNuke? <laughs> WinNuke's an APT, right? I can just keep clicking on that button and you're gonna keep getting that. Oh, and so that, that counts, right? That's an APT, your firewall didn't block that shit. An APT is the boogeyman, okay? <laughs> this is what an APT is. It is an excuse for all of us to fail at our jobs. Oh no, dude, it's not my fault. I mean, the system's completely unpatched. I have no firewall, I did no system hardening, but it was an advanced persistent threat. It's not like it was a virus. Nobody exploited something like that I could have patched 10 weeks ago. How long did it take Apple to patch that into cell phones? Never mind, that's just weird. Okay, so I have a cure for this. There's an easy way to get rid of the boogeyman. I know exactly where to go. I know who I'm gonna call. There's a bunch of vendors outside with booths that say APT. And let's just give them a hand, because they've just, they, I can't believe the proton packs. That's just phenomenal. That's, that's impressive, okay? I have so many arguments about this one that I, I don't even know where to begin. So many people say things like, do we really need an antivirus? Who here thinks we all need an antivirus? Awesome, I have a lot of Mac users in here. This is fantastic, this is gonna be a lot of fun. Okay, who here thinks you don't need an antivirus? Okay, who here has two arms? <laughs> who here has one arm? <laughs> all right, we've, we've got a very, very fun crowd, okay? What do people think an antivirus does? What does grandma think an antivirus does? It is protection from everything. There's never gonna be any threats against my computer because I have Windows and an antivirus. It's super, super clean, right? What does it really offer? The antivirus offers something very, very simple. It's protection from known bad files which cause harm in the opinions of the antivirus vendors. And text files contain the word I harm. Okay, is an AV really that bad? Yes, because the users need education. Take a cross section of humanity and you'll be embarrassed, okay? People are stupid. I, I even heard this on the news the other day and it was just terrible 
They were talking about how dependent all of us are on technology. Everybody flocks out to buy the latest whatever gadget, but nobody understands how any of this works. Half the people in the, the U.S. probably barely have a high school science understanding, and I don't know when you all went to high school, but when I went there, that was still pretty embarrassing. Okay? If you think detection of known threats is all you really need, then you don't need a pen test, you need a new career path. Okay? Management. If you think security is a tool, then you are a tool. Dave Marcus, Director of Security Research for McKay. The guy is a hero of mine. I'm wearing a t-shirt. Poor unallocated face just to pimp how awesome all of these guys are. But here's somebody who works in the industry that seriously has a good understanding of this stuff, okay? And that allows me to segue into my next part, which is why are all these guys sitting out there telling me about their silver bullet appliances that are going to solve all of my problems? They really don't know me very well. I have a lot of problems myself. I describe them. I walk funny. I think it's part of syphilis. Um, point is, we've kind of turned into a society of what tool can I buy to fix this being the first question on everybody's mind. Every last one of you, whether you do this or not, know that your manager has turned to you when you told them about a problem and said, well, what do I buy to make this go away? It's the instant go-to solution that we go to, and we just we don't have anything like, I don't know, basic system hardening. Did, did nobody remember just the absolute basics of security, like, I don't know, changing your password from Alpine? We need basic system hardening. We need layers of security. Silver bullet appliances just don't exist. I don't care who's selling it to you. It's a bunch of garbage. So let's imagine ourselves a completely made up company, a completely made up network that none of you ate at today. Uh, imagine network running at a fast food restaurant. Okay. They have hundreds or thousands of stores, so they're really, really cheap. Um, uh, imagine how many chicken nuggets it costs to buy a router. Okay. Chicken nuggets are 99 cents, and Cisco is Man, I can't even do that math in my head, the number's too big. Uh, yeah, so the switches don't support important things like maybe VLANs. So what they do is to segment off the network, they're going to run the credit card traffic on one IP scheme and run everything else on another IP scheme on the same layer two unmanaged switch. That makes sense, right? They're segmented completely. But thank God we have things like PCI to come by and, and get our backs on this. They mandate a firewall separating the two networks. Sweet. So we'll put an IP filter that says if you have an IP on subnet A, you can't talk to subnet B. If you have an IP on subnet B, you can't talk to subnet A. That makes sense. Okay. What security did we just add to our network? Okay. So if the subnets share the same wire, could you sniff both networks? <laughs> yeah. Could you maybe switch which one you're on? Yeah. So what security did we just add while we're fully PCI compliant? Okay. Security appliances are not a bad thing, okay? Do not ever assume that I know what I'm talking about. I mean, don't assume that these things aren't important. Security needs layers, right? Everything has a place where it belongs. Simple firewalls do have a place. You look up all the IPs assigned to China, you ban them all, and it makes life just that slight bit easier, right? That's a fact. Web application filters, also a good thing. However, if you have vulnerabilities like apostrophe or one equals one dash dash, and that lets you into the bank account, it doesn't help at all. All right, an IDS tells you after your attack, that's helpful, right? Congratulations, you got stabbed in the back, you're bleeding pretty severely, you might want to call an ambulance. Uh, okay, IPS is really good to prevent known attacks, right? You can actually get half decent IPSs these days, they have a nice signature, they'll block the things that they know about. Works kind of like an antivirus, right? Doesn't fix the whole problem, right? So what prevents poorly written code? Hiring good coders, right? Is there any security appliance you can get that will fix all of the code that your monkeys write? No. Find a better monkey. Enough monkeys can write Shakespeare. It's true. It's true. What prevents a completely unpatched system from getting owned? Turning it off. <laughs> Right? That's all you got. It, it, what protects a system from even basic system hardening? Again, pretty much turning it off. Right? Okay. I want to rant on passwords a bit, and Bruce sort of stole all of my thunder because he's such a better presenter than me. 
Uh, but a word of thanks to AMD and NVIDIA for their awesome hardware. Uh, it's made our lives better. Pure Hate has like an enormous cluster that cracks passwords with uh, just the speed of light. He's got like 10 GPUs in him. It's disgusting. Uh, thanks to all the demons, the DEFCON password cracking challenge. The guys just keep writing their software and they, they will literally crack every hash that is posted on the internet. And they learn things like, gosh, users all the time seem to have a capital letter in the first spot and then two or four digits at the end of a regular dictionary word. Or they just use passwords, right? And then all the math gods that actually write the password crackers for this stuff, they write this out. I, I have met a few of these guys, and it's amazing they're able to speak English with how much physics they understand in their head. Um, point is, CPUs are fast, GPUs are even faster, and the password crackers are just ridiculously optimized these days. But what part of the encryption are we actually cracking? Uh, again, stolen thunder by Bruce. When you have a 1024-bit cert and people are whining about it, what are you going to say? It's like, oh, man, 1024. I I'll have this by lunchtime. No, no, you won't. You'll have it in like five minutes, okay? We're attacking the parts of the user input. We're attacking the passphrases and things like that. These people are stupid. The vast majority of people are stupid. Half of us are stupid. And probably half of you are guilty of password reuse. And that's just embarrassing in this day and age, especially if you have a sweet password, like, wireless. Free Wi-Fi is also one of my favorites. F-R-3-3. Three, three. <laughs> no, you don't. I've been using that all day, and I really appreciate it for the downloading of my pictures. Now, point is, passwords are weak. The whole idea behind passwords is weak, because think of an eight-character word. Password. Who designed this, right? We're going to make up a system called passwords, and the minimum and the maximum is going to be eight, eight characters. Sweet. <laughs> okay? So we'll add another requirement, like a capital letter, maybe add a requirement like a number at the end, or uh, a symbol, something like that. It makes it, you know, character sets will definitely slow down cracking. And if you're talking about a nine character password, it'll slow it down from 12 seconds to like almost a minute, right? <laughs> at the end of the day, all you're doing is making the password very, very complex for the user to remember and still really easy to brute force, okay? XKCD simply has to be quoted in all my talks. Okay. We're encouraging users to make passwords like Troubadour 83, PR 0, UB 4, door 80. It's just ridiculous. Nobody's gonna remember this. I remember when I used to do this garbage. I could never remember which character I substituted for what. And then you got those few things in Leap that have like two different character translations. I'm trying to remember which one is this. That? Do I use an ant? I have no idea. You can't remember anything, so you write it down at the bottom of your keyboard. And thank you for that one, too. Before I put this up, how many of you were already thinking about correct source battery staple? Since this came, yes, thank you. Since this came out like six weeks ago almost, I, I, I think about this constantly. It just pops into my head randomly because of this stupid little picture he had to draw with the horse saying that that's a battery staple and the guy saying correct. I can't forget it. Four completely random words that have nothing to do with one another that will take decades to crack because it's just so daggum long. You don't have to raise your hand, just yell at me. I'm pretty sure that if you took a combination of, well, first of all, you have to know that it's four different words, right? Okay. So it could be five, it could be three, it could be 27. But the, and at the end of the day, you would have to get a four different English words, and out of the billion possible English words together, it'll still take quite a while. And I will be addressing the rest of that in just a second, okay? Pass phrases, okay? Pass phrases, but they're all <laughs> trolls lost. They're all trolls like you, okay? So you list a few random words. That's a good idea. I like that idea. It has some flaws. I personally prefer sentences. I like full sentences, quotes from non-famous people that are just famous to me. Uh, you know, sentences are good because they include punctuation, proper capitalization. Uh, uh, you know, just a, a comma, a hyphen, an exclamation point at the end are going to significantly increase the amount of time it takes to brute force that. Because now you have to find my comma, you have to figure out my punctuation, and it's a lot more than four random words. Uh, simple things to remember that I like: uh, lyrics to a favorite song, album titles. A string of descriptive words of an ex-girlfriend. 
<laughs> I'd tell you, but then I'd have no, that's just too cliche. Uh, okay. The point is that the math works, right? You're talking about like five 12 bit keys and worse. To brute force these things, even on the incredible hardware that some of us personally own and you darn well know the feds own, is going to be a nightmare. You're not going to crack my hard drive encryption with 512 bit encryption anytime soon. By that point, I'll be dead. I won't care that you have the contents of my hard drive. It really doesn't matter that much. Just the word password fills people with fear and anguish because they're, oh my God, how complex of a password am I going to have to make that bastard in IT leave me alone? And then I'm going to have to change it in like 30 days. I'll just, uh, and I can't use any of the last three. Fine, I'll just use the same word and do different character replacements. And then you start forgetting the character. It, 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 it's a nightmare. So all of you just stop using this word. Right now, every last one of you, do not use the word. It doesn't exist. It has been stricken from the English language, and it will not return. The word is passphrase. People will thank you. Even grandma can remember some song from 1920 that she really enjoyed, and it makes it easy. Okay? I kind of like to spew a lot of hatred. And I'm going to take a little bit of time out to make sure that you all feel good. Does everybody feel good? It's like 5 o'clock. Aren't you awake? Did you all skip lunch? What's your high score on Beach Bitch? <laughs> <laughs> to break for throwing things? Anybody got something? No? Okay. You're all unarmed. This is pathetic. All right. So I'd like to talk about one of my other favorite topics. I, I have a lot of favorite things that I like to gripe about. And I want to... Oh, shit. That's the wrong slide. I want to talk about Apple. <laughs> I want to talk about Apple. It's very, very near and dear to my heart. Apple. Now, again, I'd like to caution you <laughs> that you're all biased. You're all very biased. For instance, I myself am right in this general vicinity of the, of the list. And, and the people I'm going to be talking about are, are uh, in, in this top bar a little bit. We're, we're going to talk about that. Um, oh God, where to go? Okay. The first thing that comes to mind when I think about Macs, and, and anybody that's a non-Mac user or a Mac user has to agree with me, is hardware costs. Okay. So I set myself a few goals. I said, okay, I'm going to go out. I'm going to find the prices of Macs. I'm going to look at the hardware specifications. I'm going to compare it to, you know, PCs that I'm familiar with. You know, Dell's a very big name, very common. They're not the cheapest. They're not the most expensive. They're kind of middle of the run. And I'm just going to kind of work out, you know, how much OS X actually costs. Uh, you know, Mac offers cheaper upgrades than Windows. So you got to factor in how many times you want to upgrade before I break even. You know, so kind of interesting. And I started doing all this research, and wouldn't you know that jerk Michael Dell beat me to it. So he actually posts on his website a, a direct comparison between his products and Apple products. Can you imagine that? A business guy that compares himself to his competitors? Uh, <laughs> So uh, it, it's kind of a smaller picture I stole from their website without attributing it properly. But uh, you, you'll find that, in fact, the Dell for uh, $949 is directly compared to the MacBook for $2,200. And then the Dell for $1,049 is directly compared to the $2,300 Mac. So roughly, I worked out OS X costs like $1,100. And that's not too bad because it comes with that glowing logo on the back of the laptop, which I really like. I mean, I've always wanted to do that. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, you got to give it up. That's, that's pretty sweet, right? I mean, glowing logo on the back of the laptop is probably worth $1,100 to me. Um, oh, I'm really concerned about my image. I mean, that's why I wear a black t-shirt. I was going to wear jeans, but I didn't have a turtleneck. Oh. Okay, so hardware specs, right? All the Mac users are like, well, yeah, okay, it's not the cheapest hardware. I got to admit that. I mean, it's not as expensive as you think, but it, it's it's not that bad. But it's so sweet, man. It's got all the newest stuff. It's so awesome. You can have that that light bridge or Thunderbolt or Thunderfart or whatever they call it with the the fifty dollar cables that you still have to plug into the wall to get power. And there's actually no devices that connect to it, so you just can use it to connect two Macs together, kind of like an Ethernet cable, but a little slower. Um, but I mean, it's sweet because it's new. And it's called, like, Thor the God of Thunder or something, right? I, I, I'm actually not making fun. I seriously have no idea what it's called. Uh, so I decided to go out and compare the iPhone 4 to some of the best Android phones on the market. Uh, so I started looking you know, for things like the camera specifications, the, the flash, 
because uh, that, was, that was a really big addition that was lacking up. You know, just the general specs of the phone. And once again, I'm completely lazy and write my talks for the last possible second 10 minutes ago. And uh, so I stole this grievously again. So when the iPhone 4 came out, wouldn't you know it, some jerk already went ahead and compared it to all the stuff. So these are all phones that existed at the same time that the iPhone 4 was released, at least you know within a few months of each other, they were pretty close. And it, it's a lot of information to digest, but the, the important part is like green is the winner, okay? And the things that aren't colored are like even. So realistically speaking, Apple users are absolutely right. They, they do have nice hardware. And in six months later, when everybody else has it, it just happens to be $1,100 cheaper. Of course, the Apple price didn't drop at all, so in six months, the two pieces are identical, except for $1,100, whereas the day it came out, maybe not so much, right? Apple software. A lot of people quote this, you know, I just really like the Apple software, they just have really great stuff. And I mean, it's, it's, it's just like Linux, I switched from Linux because, you know, Ubuntu just wasn't doing it for me, it didn't have that, that cool effect where you, you sweep the mouse across and the finder icons get bigger. I always loved that. Sorry. Uh, so they, they switch to it and they say, you know, let's use BSD. All right, let's correct this right now. It is not BSD, <laughs> okay? Apple took the mock kernel, modified it, and could not get the code resubmitted back because they refused to accept it. I can't imagine why, okay? They took a lot of the BSD subsystem, heavily modified it, handed it back. They refused to accept it, again. I can't imagine why their coding standards wouldn't be good enough for the open source community, but they decided it wasn't, okay? I have people tell me all the time, well, I'm writing software for Linux, but I use my Mac because it's just POSIX compliant, and that's really all that matters, okay? Again, it is not POSIX compliant, okay? POSIX has a few very strict requirements, one of them being a case-sensitive file system. How many of you have installed OS X? Okay. Now, when you were installing it, how many of you formatted your hard drive? And when you formatted your hard drive, did you read that little drop down asking you which file system, whether you wanted case sensitive or not, and noted that if you didn't choose case sensitive, it wasn't POSIX? All right, we got three people that noticed that if you don't choose case sensitive, it's not POSIX, okay? If you configure it properly, it is POSIX compliant. If you go out and buy a Mac at the store, it is not POSIX compliant. Just a fact. And the only way to make it POSIX compliant is to wipe your hard drive and start it. <laughs> it breaks everything. The funny thing is, is Windows actually offers a runtime POSIX switch. <laughs> you can actually go into the system in a little GUI and check a box that says make it POSIX compliant. Uh, as my heckler up here is kindly noting, it breaks everything. It breaks everything on Mac to make it case sensitive. It breaks everything on Windows to make it case sensitive. Surprise, programmers suck, okay? <laughs> POSIX is a, a standard that kind of goes for all the Unix-like operating systems that has a set of requirements, and then when you write code to that requirement set, it should run on any POSIX-compliant system as long as it's recompiled. So it's, it's just a standards-based thing, and it's mostly used for like Linux and Unix, but because everybody thinks that Mac's just BSD, they just run Mac and say, it's always the same. It's not, okay? If you code it on Mac and it doesn't work on Windows, then that's expected. If you code it on Mac and it doesn't work on Linux, people are amazed. It's like, oh, well, why doesn't it work? Maybe because you didn't capitalize it properly because you've never known to do that. Okay? We'll talk about your Python later, okay? <laughs> OS hardening. Really? <laughs> It'll be in there. It'll be in there. I promised them a shout out. <laughs> okay. Windows system hardening. Things that Microsoft has done to make their OS better over time, compared to things that Mac has done to make their system better over time, okay? DEP, uh, data execution prevention to stop execution on the stack, was added in Windows XP, okay? Conversely, DEP was added in uh, OS 10.4.4, which happened to be the first Intel release, and this is an Intel-only feature. It doesn't do it on the two PC. So, they're way ahead of the curve, right? The first time that instruction is available to them, they immediately add support for it. That's fantastic. They got a great track record for security. Right up until you notice ASLR, okay? Address space randomization makes exploiting something much harder because the stack is moving around. You don't know what address to jump to, 
and it gives you problems. That was added for Windows and Windows Vista and IE8, and it was added in Lion, which, if I'm not mistaken, there's a good couple years in there somewhere. I'm sure it does work, and that's really great of them to catch up. Uh, Built-in antivirus in Windows. That's a really important thing, because as we all know, there's a lot of Windows viruses out there. Uh, how many of you have an antivirus on your Windows system? That's fair. How many of you have an antivirus on your Linux system? I am genuinely raising my hand. Why am I genuinely raising my hand? Because people are idiots. And those of you that have a Windows system and didn't raise your hand in the first place are my bloody problem. I go to a customer site, I hand them my USB drive. They drop a file on there, and their stupid computer infects my USB drive. And then I hand it to another customer, and I infect that customer, and they get mad at me. So I actually have to scan. Hmm? That's fair. I'm running a Linux system myself. But the point is, I have to run an antivirus that takes things off of my thumb drives that my stupid customers add on to it so that I don't infect my other customers. Because there's nothing more embarrassing as a security guy that says, oh, yeah, here you go, the update's on here. Dude, what are you trying to give me, a virus? That, that, that doesn't look good on the resume. Okay, I told you, shut, just yell. That, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. <laughs> Thank you, folks, for a great audience. <laughs> okay? Windows and Mac both have comparable built-in firewalls, but when the idea of an antivirus was introduced by Apple, they came out on their website and they said, we recommend all of our users get an antivirus. How many of you remember reading that recommendation? It was very well put together, very well thought out. The reason most of you aren't ra raising your hands is because I think it was uh, maybe 48 hours later, it was completely removed without a trace from the website. Why? Because of these several thousand page forum topics with the Mac users whining about how elite their systems are that they don't need an antivirus that their manufacturer told them to do. How many of you take your car in for an oil change? Once in a while, maybe. How many of you get more than 9,000 miles out of your car? <laughs> okay. If the manufacturer of the software tells you you need to do something and you completely ignore it, it is typically at your own peril. I myself find that driving my car into a brick wall is a bad idea, and then I look in the manual and it tells, please do not drive Nissan into brick wall. They have smart suggestions, they write them out, they tell you what to do, and then you whine and complain until you, you just don't have to do it anymore. The built-in AV and Windows, they have a... Uh, yeah, there was, there's Defender and then there's... It, it's, it's part of Windows, it's forced by the upgrade process now. Um, lastly, I'm going to compare Gen 2 Hard and Linux. I, I would love to actually, I'd love to actually, actually it's not, believe it or not, here, check this out, it's not even, it's not even compiling in the background, I don't even have anything open right now, it's awesome, right, so, you can't compare these systems to like a hardened server, that's just not fair, but the fact of the matter is, when the manufacturer makes recommendations that you grievously ignore, and whine about so much that they retract, that is just embarrassing. If you keep screaming up and down, Tuna, that you don't need to wear a condom because there's no herpes, then we'll see how that works out for you. Uh, embedded security. Embedded security. Okay. All jailbroken iPhones are vulnerable to exploits. How do we know this? Because we had to jailbreak them in the first place. Right? They remain that way indefinitely, typically, because there's no easy way to close the hole because you can no longer upgrade the phone properly without losing the jailbreak you did in the first place. And obviously you don't want that. So everybody remembers jailbreak me, right? This is a fabulous website, right? You just go to this website, it drops an exploit, pops root on your phone, and then hands you back access, right? Who here thinks that Chronic, the guy who wrote this, has a really large botnet? I'm sure that the guy is honest. I can't say I do the same thing in his place. I would personally love a million iPhone botnet because that would just be way too funny. However, if I want one, I can always just put my phone on AT&T's network scans for port 22, and then log into everything with Alpine, and that's probably going to get me pretty far. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm, I am not comparing Apple to others. I am merely trying to point out that the holier-than-thou attitude is completely unwarranted. Everything has its vulnerabilities. Nothing is perfect. But being blind and burying your head in the sand and saying, it doesn't affect me, doesn't really help you. Okay? 
That's what I tell all the women beforehand. Okay. <laughs> Open platforms. Okay. This is my absolute worst hatred of a set of words. Because anytime you see the words open platform, it literally means the opposite. This is what everybody that has a garbage closed platform advertises and try to convince you that everything's really open and friendly. You know, when you get the open office versus Microsoft office, uh, you know, they, they always say, well, you can use our format. It's open. And, you know, and Microsoft, oh, no, our format's open, too. We have a completely open platform. And everybody knows how open Microsoft is. And Adobe, man, I love Flash. <laughs> okay. So what about the Apple products, right? You can't load any music on your iPod without iTunes. Uh, those of you that don't have a Mac and have an iPod, have you ever tried to use iTunes on Windows? I have seriously had more enjoyable root canals. Uh, and before you raise your hand and say, oh, no, you can do it with XYZ product, that's true for like three days. And then Apple closes the thing that they were doing or forces the device identifier, does some other weird thing to break it as much as they possibly can. And when they start failing at that, they just release a new product that no longer does that anything similar like when they went from the regular iPods to the Nanos to the Touches. Every time they break the damn format and you can't sync anymore. And they do it on purpose because that's the only thing that contains them in release. So that's just cheap. You can't load an app on your iPod or iPhone unless you get it from Apple. That's great. I enjoy my Victory Gin, my Victory Cigarettes, my Victory Coffee. Anybody? Excellent. Thank you. One laugh. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Unless you want to void your warranty. Okay. You can't develop an app for the iPod or the iPhone without paying for the SDK until very recently they actually allow you to download the SDK for free, which is nice. They only take 30% of your profits too, non-negotiable no matter what, even if you're charging 10 cents. Um, don't know how much they're going to make on 3 cents, but whatever. Uh, my very favorite is you can't even open your own device to replace the battery. Who here has an iPhone 4 that they got on day one? Thank you, thank you. Okay, and now how many of you have had to replace your battery? Okay, I was actually planning for this talk, and I was referencing an article, and the guy next to me is like, oh, dude, that is so bull, and he pulls out his phone, oh, my God. Because when you take your iPhone, original iPhone, in for service, and you have them do anything on the device, whether it's replace the battery, or whether there's a problem with it, or, you know, it just if you hand it to them and they walk away, they actually take the Phillips head screws that came in the device originally and replace them with these, uh, they're sort of a five-pointed torque screw, except they're rounded on the edges. And they replace the screws with the security screws so that the next time you have to pay $180 or whatever it is to come back to them to get the battery replaced. They're actually not only locking down the software you have with every update, they're locking down the hardware that you bought and paid for every time. Does this sound like anything else I've heard of, Sony? <laughs> Where's off Apple when you need it? <laughs> yeah, and, th and now those screws do come on the new phones as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, you can. You can definitely buy anything from China. Okay. Easy to use. Apple products are so easy to use. My grandmother can use it. My monkey can use it. Have you ever tried to disable your eyesight camera? Who knows how to disable your eyesight camera? Really easy. Black electrical tape. That's right. Black electrical tape is how you disable your eyesight camera because you can't do it with the Apple software. You have to find some random hacks that load on your system and run exploits to try to disable the camera built in so that you can fap in peace. Okay? You can't even make the computer go to uh, close the lid without going to sleep. I pick up my laptop all the time. I close the lid. I walk somewhere else. I walk somewhere else. And it's still powered on and ready to go. With an Apple, you have to download a third-party piece of software because they can't even bother to build that into the OS. In Windows, I have this cute little drop-down, sleep, hibernate, do nothing. You don't have that option in Mac. Yeah, a USB keyboard. Thank you. Yeah. So you just walk around with a TT plugged in, and not only does it move your mouse for you so your boss thinks you're working, but it also prevents it from turning <laughs> off. <laughs> okay. My very, very favorite, and again, Wi-Fi guy, so I have to give it out to this. You cannot remove any of the previously connected two Wi-Fi networks from the preferred network list of an iPod or an iPhone, okay? Without doing a full reset on all your network configurations and losing everything, or while you're in range of that network. So you go to your boy's house, 
you connect to dudes network, okay? And then you go to the coffee shop later, I run Karma, which by the way, for some reason, Apple is one of the only products that's still vulnerable to Karma. Can I give them applause for that or something? I mean, it's been 10 years now and they, they still haven't bloody patched that, okay? Apple, being the only people that haven't patched the Karma exploit properly, won't even let you clean up that list so that you're not as vulnerable, right? Yeah, right, and that's just a great excuse. But don't worry about this because it's really not a security vo uh, violation. I talked to the Apple staff and they assured me that there's no problems with this and, you know, karma doesn't exist. I'm sure that that's the way they live because if karma did exist, they probably wouldn't do some of the other things that they do. They're a good, honest company, right? Everybody talks about how great Apple is. Their workers don't commit suicide constantly or anything like that. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, those are the Chinese... Uh, that the Apple employees in the States are completely legit. Nobody's ever walked in the Apple store and gotten spare parts or anything traded out in the demo machine. Uh, the point is you can't get the hardware fixed as a civilian without providing the username and password to the computer. So if you drop the laptop and break the hinges on it, I, th this is the original terms of service. They actually required you to provide full admin credentials for the device. They've since retracted this, and especially the... Uh, how are Macs using governments is completely not accurate. Uh, the fact is, is they have a completely different set of terms of service that allow them to do awesome things like remove the hard drive, which thank God they're not shipping our national secrets to China anymore. Uh, AppleCare will ship your computer to some random country. Uh, not all the time. You do have the option of walking into the Apple store yourself. There's no Apple store in my city, but I kind of consider that a blessing myself. But they, they reserve the right to ship not only your hardware, but your data to any of their partners in any country, they name like 15 and then they say, or anywhere else we feel like it, just in case we need to do something with it. You know, places like China. I'm very comfortable with my data going to China. Uh, <laughs> uh, Apple Terms of Service. When you buy the AppleCare product, you buy nothing but a sheet of paper at the store. Okay, you go in, they hand you a sheet of paper, and it lists all the things that they do for you, you know, what the, the limits of liabilities are, what they cover. And the last line of this, or actually, I'm sorry, it's not the last line. It's like buried in the middle. I think it was section 10B. Uh, it says, we reserve the right to change any and all of this text on our website. And when you go to the website and you do a find and replace for like any given sentence, they're not there, right? They change the entire set on their website, okay? And again, I'm not trying to say that Apple's the only one doing this. Everybody does this. For some reason, we just allow this because none of us actually read these things. We just click on the button and keep going. And, oh, yeah, here, I'll take this sheet of paper, right? Nobody reads this stuff. Nobody really cares. All of these companies have these despicable practices, all of them, including Apple. So if you want a good, honest company, you'll have to find it somewhere else, okay? <laughs> so I ask you, nearly in closing, what really makes a Mac user and that's freedom, right? Steve Jobs says it best, right? He had a really great conversation. I, I kind of have to read this a little bit. He had a great conversation with a reporter uh, over, God, it had to be several drinks. Uh, the reporter asks him, you know, would the boy think the iPad is the faintest thing to do with a revolution when revolutions are about freedom? And Steve Jobs says to the man, yes, freedom from programs that steal your private data, freedom from programs that crash your battery, Freedom from porn. Yep, freedom. The times they are a-changing, and some traditional PC folks feel like their world is slipping away. It is. I want to ask just for a second, when Steve Jobs offers freedom from programs that steal your data, is he excluding the fact that they track everywhere your iPhone goes and upload it to their own servers at night? Because, I mean, my personal location certainly isn't my data, right? Or how about freedom from programs that crash your battery? Like, making a battery that the user's not allowed to replace so that they can pay 180 something dollars to get it replaced themselves. Personally, I think freedom from porn is a good thing. I'd have a lot more spare time if it weren't for porn. Uh, <laughs> but the point is, is he's right. The times are changing. The frog is sitting in a pot, but the pot's not boiling. He's just slowly heating it up and just taking away one small thing at a time, and you're complacent about it. They take away your control to install applications to your own device. You don't have root access to your device. Well, technically you do, because everything runs on an iPhone as root, 
but they don't actually give you access to do it, right? You have no control over your own device, and yet somehow it's acceptable, right? There, there is a lot of change going on, and I'm not so sure we should be happy about it. Um, I'd like to close this talk with questions. If the question is stupid, I'm going to set you on fire. No, actually, I'm not going to take any questions at all. All of you have a great day, and I hate you as much as you hate me. Thank you.